thank you all for, for being here today, those who are uh, coming in and going to listen to the webinar and of, of course all our wonderful uh, guests tonight. Uh, this webinar is organized by uh, the Culture Center of uh, the Lycée Francais de New York, and I'm Pascal Richard, I'm director of that uh, Culture Center. So we will be asking questions to our panelists, uh, together with Florian, who is uh, a student from, uh, from Terminal, from 12th grade, uh, for about 45 minutes. And uh, during that conversation, you can ask questions to the panelists on the Q&A. And then at the end of this 45 minutes or so, we'll try to take uh, 10 minutes to answer uh, the questions. But first of all, I'm going to uh, let the floor, give the floor to Evelyne Esté, director of the Lycée Français de New York, who is going to say a few words. Merci Pascal, um, thank you. And thank you everybody for making it tonight. Um, our cultural center is still um, pretty much online, but we have high hopes to reopen in the auditorium in January, and that will be super exciting. Um, but, but here we are, and um, thanks to everybody who's making it. A uh, big thank you to our guests. So, um, Mayn Bonetti, uh, Naima Ibrahi Kijo, Alexi Lloyd, and Jonathan Woods. So all of them actually have a link to the Lycée. Um, mine, who I think is going to join us shortly, um, recommended actually a series of short, um, short movies, uh, whatever you say, anyway, court métrage, um, uh, Afrofuturistic, uh, five of them, which we, we saw last week uh, that were great. Alexis Lloyd, um, uh, Alexis, maybe you wave. Uh, okay. is a parent at the Lycée. I see him very frequently, uh, a drop-off at 76th Street. And, and he's also a long-standing, fantastic member of our cultural committee, cultural center committee. Uh, we have um, uh, Naimbo and T. So Naim, I, I, I just introduced you sort of not exactly, but thank you for the movies last week, for the court-métrage. Uh, they were great. So a big thank you. You're on mute. Yes, yeah, I'm really glad that it works. Yes, I'm so sorry I came on late. Um, no, no worries, no worries. Around here, we, you know, we just just started. <laughs> yeah, um, wonderful. So Naima Hello, Ibraki, everyone. Hello, uh, uh -huh. Naima Ibraki Joe is uh, alumna um, year uh, 2011, so uh, tenth uh, anniversary of your graduation from the lycée, and um, and Jonathan Woods, who is married to an alumna to class of 2007 of the of the lycée so welcome um to for being here and we have florian cop florian who is um, a 10th grade a 12th grade student um so very very busy right now for him but thank you very much florian for being here florian is absolutely passionate about cinema and he prepared some questions for for the panel to interview the panel so um, and, and to you, our, our family at the Lycée is very multicultural and uh, very interested in culture and the arts and the things that we do at the Cultural Center. So thank you very much for being here and enjoy the panel. With that, I will let Pascal introduce everybody a little bit more fully. Thank you, Evelyn. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm going to introduce you a little bit more. Yes. So tonight with us, we have Mayan Boniti. So Mayan... Uh, is the president and founder of the African Film Festival in New York. Uh, Mayan, you were born in Sierra Leone and, and founded the festival 30 years ago. And uh, your goal was always to develop a platform for African filmmakers, uh, for which the festival was often the first uh, introduction to the US uh, audiences. And you have written about uh, African directors and you have created a kind of database for the African uh, films. And in 2010, you received the prestigious Ordre des Arts et des Lettres from the French government. And then we have Naima, Naima Ibrahikijo, who is an uh, actress and screenwriter. And as uh, Evelyn said, an alumna from, uh, from the Lycée. Naima is franco beninese and she's, she grew up between uh, uh, Paris and, uh, and Brooklyn. And she's been a paramedic on uh, Chicago Med for six combined seasons. And uh, she has acted on theater stages all over the country. <clears throat> she's a graduate uh, of the School of Steppenwolf 
and received a BA from Yale University. And uh, she's currently working on a, a musical, uh, Yemanda, which is going to be premiered at Mass Mocha in February, 2022. Are we allowed to, to buy uh, seats uh, as of uh, tickets as of now? Wow. That's I really think exciting. so. It'll be sometime in, in the fall also in New York. So don't worry about it. <laughs> and uh, you're also developing a short film with a French uh, production company. You'll tell us more about that. And then we have Alexis Lloyd, who is a feature film writer, producer, and director. Uh, born in Paris, Alexis, uh, who has, uh, Evelyn said, is a parent at the Lycée, now lives in New York. And you are the former CEO of a uh, London-based uh, film studio, Guild Entertainment, and also Pate UK. Uh, during these years as a studio executive, you supervi supervised uh, the production, financing, and distributing of uh, over 90 features. And you wrote and directed three films, including the feature film 30 Beats, and uh, also group inspired by the novel by uh, Irving Yalom, The Schopenhauer Cure, uh, with a pilot that was uh, presented on YouTube uh, uh, as a web series in certain episodes uh, shown on PBS, yeah. And then we have Jonathan Wood, writer and producer. Uh, so since joining the time in 2012, you have played a key role mm -hmm. in developing and producing uh, award-winning stories. And uh, you had just uh, finished producing a five-part series on Netflix uh, on the first all civilian space. Uh, flight mission inspiration four which is a great uh, great series i really recommend it to everybody and um, you've just completed the production of space explorers the iss experience uh you the biggest production in space uh, ever which will be released in 2022 you have also produced a year in space a 12 episode uh, docu-series focusing on scott skelly's year-long mission to uh, the, space, um, uh, the space station. And of course, I would like to say a few words about Florian Kup, uh, our student. Uh, Florian is a passionate student about filmmaking and cinema, uh, from doing cinema class in school to pursuing video projects outside of his class. He is a fan of action sport and is making videos uh, especially on mountain biking that are popular on social media to help friends break in into the professional, professional world of sports. So he plays an important role of marketing his friend by getting exposure and sponsorships through social media. And uh, there is another student from uh, Gita from uh, 12th grade who unfortunately cannot be with us tonight, but to also help prepare the questions. Voila, thank you all for being here. So the first question is, uh, I will ask the first questions, which is quite general, but uh, do you think COVID accelerated changes in the cinema industry and how? And uh, maybe Alexi, you, you want to start on that, on that questions because I heard you say wonderful thing and interesting things about that. So maybe you want to be the first to break the, um, the ice. COVID didn't change anything, but COVID accelerated a, a, a very big shift uh, that has been happening in, in the world of uh, movies and series. The, the shift is really a transfer of talent, of resources, of economic model and, and creative talent from feature film uh, with its format and with its partners to the world of series. And uh, people were stuck home uh, cinemas were closed for more than a year and what we could see coming as a you know as, as a very historical historically meaningful dramatic shift from uh, from feature film to series was really accelerated by um, by covid what it also did is that it accelerated the shift within the series world from the traditional, uh, TV players, the broadcasters, but you know, especially also the, the cable stations to, to the streamers, to the digital companies. Um, 
uh, Netflix, of course, everybody knows about, and Amazon. Apple started almost in the middle of the pandemic, uh, just before, um, and is not at full speed yet, but, uh, you know, and, and Hulu is still there. And then there is a number of uh, important uh, players in the streaming uh, territory, but really, these mega players have completely taken over the momentum in the in the feature film world um and and i think they have grown with covid you know uh, the, the whole planet has been relying on amazon uh the whole planet has been you know uh, getting deeper into netflix um and any digital platform so no, nothing that was not uh in the pipeline, but it really made the pipeline 10 times bigger and faster. Uh, to add on to that, um, do you maybe think that these platforms like Netflix, Hulu, et cetera, killed independent cinema or can be used as a tool to maybe uh, project more uh, short films and smaller movies like that? I don't think they killed indie film. I think uh, the movement towards the, let's say, the end of a historical cycle in, in indie film, uh, it, it's another chapter that is starting for indie film. Uh, what is sure is that um, a chapter that started with the beginning of uh, probably, you know, it, it was a bit uh, about the same time with the real rise of uh, VHS cassettes. Uh, you know, the video market, the cable channels, all this in the early 80s uh, it came in, in full speed. And indie film really relied uh, on, on, on these two uh, things economically that were the cable channels and, uh, the, and, the, and the VHS and then the DVD. And the DVD was even more profitable for the studios, whether they were the major studios or the indie studios, um, that lasted about, about 30 years. Now this era is over. Um, so I would say that we could see from the beginning of, you know, around 2007, 8, 9, that this, the major studios were the one who actually, you know, if somebody killed the indie film as we knew it for 30, 40 years, in a way it's the major studios as much as the streamers because they started being obsessed with uh, tent poles. And what they call the tent poles is that they basically said, we can make 15 to 20 films a year, which was the usual uh, volume of films that the major studios were uh, green lighting and producing every year, but they have to be, you know, under the umbrella of these ten, so-called tentpole films that were usually, you know, the much bigger budget with much bigger audience with global box office of a billion dollars and, uh, and, and, and general revenues of two or $3 billion. So we, we're talking of, you know, the economy of small countries here, gigantic, especially when they went into series and, and, um, and the studios, the major studios really um, accepted that that was the their future was no longer in drama, uh, that their future was almost entirely in branded franchise feature films uh, and characters. And um, of course, the big story was the Marvel Universe. So it, it really all started with Disney many, many years ago, but it's only Disney, uh, the world of Disney was considered the exception and the miracle and Walt Disney created this brand <clears throat> and the franchise and everything that went with it. But nobody really knew how to do something similar for adults and young adults. Um, the um, superhero <laughs> movies, you know, starting of course with a series of Batman and the Superman and the Spider-Man proved that the you know, the, the, the profitability of these were just so gigantic. They were the, 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 they were the billion dollar movies uh, in terms of, of revenues that the chances that feature films typically took on drama films um, 
started to, and, and they were rather expensive drama films. So it started to make no sense for the investors. It made sense for Hollywood. It made sense for the filmmakers, but it no longer made sense. And so starting in, you know, really 2008, 10, 12, the, the major studios became really, really obsessed with, um, with action, um, science fiction, adventure, and horror thriller uh, features. A few comedies. I do think. Ooh. Yes. Sorry. It, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I do feel like, because what you're talking about is making me think of things that are kind of linking the two questions about COVID and about indie films is a trend I've noticed is, especially in the lockdown, people, films maybe with bigger budgets that might not have been considered indie are kind of taking on an indie model for shooting, having to scale down in order to make things work as well. So it's not like that's a model that's been completely lost. And I feel like there's also in in kind of wanting to contrast with these tentpole movies, all these big movies, that there is a little bit of a movement of whether, whether or not they're indie in the budget level of definitely indie sensibilities, feeling like Lady Bird was one of those kind of big Oscar breakouts that came out that for me, that feels like an indie film as well. Um, and so feeling like COVID is one of those things that has made us also think about the ways in which there are some of the indie models that do work, you know, making a Marvel movie with, you know, a thousand people on set during COVID, you can't really swing that, but an indie movie with a smaller crew and a smaller cast maybe. Um, but I do think, again, linking those two things that the there is something to be said about COVID and indie films, like making that a little bit more accessible. I think um, because we're now spending so much time on platforms and we're used to seeing things on our computers or on our TVs at home, that's an experience where, you know, maybe an indie film you would have gone to Angelica and you go and see it at Angelica and that's maybe the only place you can see it. But now there's the Criterion channel and I'm out here watching all these movies on the Criterion channel or I went to Sundance in January this year because they had it all virtually. Whereas before I might not have wanted to trek out to the snow in January, but there is that platform as well where I think COVID has maybe made some of those indies, maybe not making it, a, you know, I don't know how it works in terms of like streamlining them getting made, but I think there is something where indie films are picking up a little bit of the streamer momentum and they are going to have platforms that they might not have had films getting bought at Sundance by Apple TV or by Amazon. They're going to be given a platform. Now distributors, it might not be as risky of a proposal to say, sure, I'll distribute this indie film and have it be in theaters. You know, they're like, great, we'll put it on our platform. So I think there's, and I think COVID accelerated a little bit of that. A lot of these movies that then were like, oh, we're not going to have theatrical releases. We're still able to find homes as well. The, the big okay. thing is that the, the streaming companies... Jonathan, I thought, Alexi, maybe I will let uh, Jonathan yes. say yeah. your word if you want to yeah, sure. have anything to add on this uh, change of post-COVID. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, in, in some ways, I, I agree with a lot of what was said. I, I think in some ways, development process was heavily hampered uh, because as we went into lockdown, all the momentum that, you know, platforms like Apple and Netflix were trying to you know, pick up at that vital moment where Apple was getting ready to launch, you know, they had, they had things in production two years before their launch, mm -hmm. uh, specifically their first direct -to series buy, which was home. Uh, a lot of those platforms really suffered and we all did as, as we were all sort of forced to rethink. Uh, that I think forced an acceleration conversely, when you look at uh, field production, you know, how did we manage to produce safely and effectively, especially in the doc world? It's systems like Teradec, where you can remote in and, and the person that is driving an interview across the country or on the other side of the world can see exactly what's coming through the camera. 
and the director can advise on framing a shot that he's not there or she's not there to produce. Uh, and, and that I think has really helped, uh, also the evolution of frame IO as a platform, which was just acquired by Adobe. These are massive, uh, investments. And then on the post-production side, remote post and color, the, the idea that I don't have to go to a sound studio or a color studio, uh, a color finishing room, uh, to, or the physical post house to be present there, to be able to do color. And, and I can be shipped an iPad, uh, or a monitor from Netflix and, and do that color session remotely is, is something that two to three years ago it was, was very rarely fathomable. Or I see that in my auditioning self-tapes, whereas before I maybe felt guilty sending my agent in France self-tapes and been like, I can fly back if you need me to. And now it's a tape and nobody thinks less of me for only sending in a tape instead of being there in person. Okay, since we have a lot of questions, I think maybe uh, Florian, if you want to ask uh, the, the second questions, which is also a big change that happened in the recent years. Yep. Um, so this question is more for Mrs. Bonetti. Uh, oh, how was... Start with you, Mahan. Yes. Yes. Uh, so how has movements like the Black Lives Matter movement and DI changed the film landscape, especially in the last five years? And like, how do film nowadays project political or social messages that can be used as a tool for change? Well, the Black Lives Matter, I think, shone a light on the underrepresentation of Black creatives, definitely. And um, <clears throat> not that they were never there, but it really <clears throat> also showed us how much they've contributed, but how, how, um, you know, the social, sociopolitical system sort of ignores that contribution as well. And um, so there was this race also for a lot of these platforms to, you know, source content and which is great, but how do they then decide? I mean, do you just pile everything once more or do you then shift through and try to thoughtfully, you know, um, address certain niche markets or, you know, then, I mean, for me, we just continued our work and we were able to, beyond the Netflix or the Amazons, a lot of our partners like Film at Lincoln Center, uh, Brooklyn Academy of Music, Mo Maisels, we also built our own platform because we realized that, you know, those, indie filmmakers or those little guys where you know had an opportunity at this point to um to 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 be become known like alexis said you know we were all at home and there was this demand for content so i think the black lives matter is is um has contributed to um an awareness and um then it's up to us as the creatives to decide how do we command and control that instead of having someone else dictate what or validate because this is how we always work so i mean black lives matter coronavirus i want to believe that i'm the one who validates myself <laughs> you know so that is how we've always worked. And hopefully, and it's no palaver with anyone, but it's just that, you know, the recognition, I have to recognize myself first and hopefully others will come along. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Um... Oh, that was great. Yes, everybody, uh, anyone has something to ask? And I just want to remind, uh, you know, our viewers that you can ask questions on the Q and A uh for for our guests but uh I, I know jonathan you had something to say about uh, black lives matter and you were very uh kind of into that movement in some ways as a producer or as a yeah i, I think you know if we rewind to um may 25th may 25th of last uh, of last year when george floyd was murdered in, in my hometown of minneapolis uh mm -hmm. that singular event and uh the 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 wave of protests that followed 
uh, was a real reflection point. And at that time, I was not producing a, a five-part doc series for Netflix. I was actually managing uh, about 15% of the overall company at time. I was leading the entire photo and video team. And that movement sparked a, a significant internal reflection at time uh, where we started to reflect on areas where we might be deficient in areas of race, diversity, and, and equity and inclusion. And one of the immediate results of that is that we ended up retaining one of the nation's leading voices on race, gender, and equity in the workplace. And his, his name is Sean Harper. He, was, he is wonderful. Uh, he works for UC Berkeley um, and the USC Race and Equity Center. And we brought him in to do a number of seminars and roundtable discussions and, and forcing, uh, you know, and cultivating conversations in places where we might not have had the opportunity uh, to have that movement serve as a catalyst for change in areas that we needed it in uh, in our own company and uh, within our room, within our walls. And uh, Naima, I think uh, you want to add something? I think you, you can see my enthusiastic <laughs> nodding. Um, I do think that that's the, the big shift that I am noticing here is like maybe before Black Lives Matter, there's 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 already been a demand for more diverse content. But the difference is you can write as much diverse content as you want if, like Jonathan, you're saying, if the infrastructures themselves are not changing or questioning, the people who are going to green light the projects, the people who are going to fund the projects, the people who are going to be doing all the different elements, if they're not diverse, that has such ramifications on every aspect of production. Looking at um, looking at what cameras do you use? Who is your cinematographer? Are they used to um, having people in a shot that have a real variety in skin tones? And is everybody looking as gorgeous on that camera or are they not? Who is the, you know, same with like, are you, when you're color coding, all these things and who's writing the scripts? And I'm not really one to say like, if you're not this, you can't tell that story. I think an artist's job is to inhabit everything but I think there's worth in saying okay but we also have this in our writer's room we also have this our showrunner is this there's so many levels where that diversity matters that maybe before we weren't thinking about because we're like no look we've got this nice poster but I think Black Lives Matter really made us question all the ways in which that diversity can be woven into the fabric of the industry itself yeah You muted. Yeah, maybe you can tell us a word about your the short film you are preparing. Um, who, who are you talking to? Yeah, are oh, you talking to me? Uh, we to an ah, um, I oh, guess it does. It. Hmm. Wait. Sorry, sorry. My screen, you're next to me, so I felt oh, like that's true. That's true. I know who, who knows where everybody that's is. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll, I'll be brief because I'm sure there's so many uh, questions too. Um, yeah, so this is a, a film that I'm writing. I'm writing about Jeanne Duval, who was Baudelaire's uh, muse and inspiration. Um, and I guess it is relevant to what we're talking about in terms of like what stories get told. I know I did en Bakel. I studied Baudelaire for years and years and I never knew that his poems were inspired by somebody who looked like me and I think that really could have changed a lot of my life my outlook my thoughts on myself if that story had been told to me and so um so yeah I've written a short and a feature but we're making the short first and I've got a great director in Paris Rosalie Charrier her name is and a production team there and we're uh Again, and I think diversity means a variety of things. I want to make sure that our team is diverse, not just by the numbers of like, oh, are there women? Are there people of color? But are there people from different backgrounds, people with different specialties? I, our producer, you know, he's as white as they come, but he, that, who cares if we're telling the story of a mixed race person because he's got the expertise to help this specific project. So I think, um, yeah, I think we're, we're working on making something hopefully really special and, um, and beautiful. We want to convey a lot of the, the poetry, of Baudelaire's poetry. How do you put poetry on screen? How does that look like? And Rosalie, 
um, the director has a lot of experience doing music videos and things like that. So her visuals are really evocative, really powerful. So I'm excited. I'm really excited. So I'm just going to stop here. I have to stop myself because, because I'm so excited about the project. I could talk for an hour about it. So I just, I'm going to mute myself <laughs> for the sake of this webinar. <laughs> well, thank you, Naima. That, this is actually leading me to the, my next questions which is uh, what is exactly the role of producer? We just touch on it a little bit. And, uh, you know, in the wake of that, how are the film produced today? And, uh, and more generally, what goes into raising money to shoot a movie? So whoever wants to take this large question on uh, producing. Um... What is the meaning of life? Who's... <laughs> yeah, um, Anybody wants to answer that? The exact role of a producer? It's impossible to answer the question because uh, there are very different kinds of producers. There are producers who are very hands-on, on set, who really understand what goes on uh, in the filmmaking process, the physical uh, reality of it. There are producers who are uh, really only working their phones and are networking and are working both the money side and the networking side and have really the, the their specialty is to both network bringing um, uh, talents and money together uh, they really don't need to be involved in the filmmaking process at all uh, some producers are really uh, good about the purely creative process because directors and writers need uh, sounding boards, but more than sounding boards, they, they really need partners. And some of the greatest films were uh, backed, supported by, by great producers who, who really were filmmakers in their own right, not directly uh, directing scenes, but really being very close to the creative process. So, you know, after 30 years in the business, I can tell you that there's not, there's not, it's not, it's not a profession under the name of producer. There are five or six different professions this is why it's a little tricky yeah and it depends what country you're in you ask people in france that's what i've been learning I'm like producer, exec, executive producer in france and in america mean completely different things in france executive producer is you execute you're the one who's on set making stuff happen but in the u.s usually executive producer is you gave some money or you know who, who knows yeah but i think jonathan can probably tell more than i can about the the, one of the shifts that has been really uh, significant and dramatic um, in the past 10 years has been the um, lesser power of directors as author, let's say, filmmakers, and the rising power of writer-producers and the, and, and the new showrunners. I mean, the new stars of Hollywood and also of indie, indie scene. There's, there's no indie series, really, but... Uh, probably more in the documentary uh, world, um, which in itself, you know, is it's a golden age for TV series. It's a golden age for documentaries. Uh, it's not a golden age for film for for directors, but it is a great age for um, for anybody who considers a sort of dual dual progression with writing and producing. Jonathan. Yes, I, I think there's, uh, I mean, certainly coming out of this Netflix series, my, my impression of working on very small projects and now this very significant, uh, you know, a five part series that was produced in start to finish in under nine months was an extraordinary feat that took a lot of energy from multiple different teams. We started very small. I was employee number one on this project on January 6th. And I was responsible for meeting the principal uh, subject and then subjects and determining the best way and format and which camera platforms we were going to be on all the way through the, the uh, initial pitch meetings where we were brokering, brokering production services agreements. Uh, it was my responsibility to work with SpaceX and, and broker our production agreement uh, with the DOD and the Pentagon when we were filming with the Air Force and the Coast Guard. Uh, it was my job to uh, handle all the access to capture the intimate home stories of all of these people who were going to go to space for the first time and the first impressions. So, uh, all of that, including 
uh, appearance releases, location releases, the logistics for travel, understanding how we have four crews uh, or at the launch, seven crews filming simultaneously in three different time zones, making sure that everybody's media is going to line up on the timeline when it when it hits the post house uh, to be able to turn around a you know hundred minute season finale in ten days after the crew returned from space. It is really mind numbing, and I think you know maybe relevant for the audience to hear. There is an aspect of what makes a great producer that is simply just being able to identify, think ahead, and solve problems. That is, I think, the essence of what, what makes an excellent producer. And when you fold in having a great instinct for story, being able to solve the technical problems, being great with people, uh, having a little bit of charisma and holding a conversation and doing the difficult things that nobody wants to do, that in essence is, I think, uh, how I spent most of my last nine months. Hmm. So uh, maybe we'll um, we'll go to the next question. Florian, do you do you want to um, ask uh, the next question? Next question. Um, yeah, I mean, there's also a great question in the Q and A that maybe if you guys want to take a look at first. Um, yeah, it's a really good question. It's uh, so the question in the Q and A is is Michael who is uh, asking. Uh, <clears throat> How is the emphasis on remakes and sequels affecting creativity and innovative origin originality in the film industry? Anybody wants to answer that? We're going to do that at the end, but it's fine. I think the, the, the answer is in the question. Yeah, I think there's a desire to have something that feels safe, that feels like Oh, great. We'll know we have a built-in audience for this. I think seeing a lot of the remakes in the past year with, I, I feel like they go hand in hand with the world situation, just a lot of unrest and turmoil. And it feels nice and safe to have something that's a story I already know, whether it's a prequel, a sequel, a spinoff, that feels um, much more safe and kind of speaks to what Alexis was talking about a little bit earlier about the 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 tent poles and and the budgets and and what kind of return are we getting I think those are usually at least in my you know my limited tiny tiny limited experience on the outside is I think is comes from a place of wanting to have something that feels safe and secure but that's not to say that you know you can't make something that's a bit of a gamble but it's a gamble so it takes more convincing no, but there is a sort of bigger cultural shift which is about data uh, the the big change is that for for many many years uh, the world of film was ruled by a philosophy saying nobody really knows what's going to happen you have to take bets constantly and every project every film is a prototype uh, the combination of the um, you know uh, branded franchises with you know uh, superheroes that that can come and come and go and come and go i mean you can come back uh, several times as well as the fact that the new players the netflix the amazon the apple all this is much more data driven than it ever was. Uh, the, it's, it's a big, big um, change when you go from having some executives who have, um, you, who do their job, but they ultimately use their subjective gut feeling about what to green light and what to not to green light. Now, a lot of the green lighting process is data based. And that's, that's a very big change. So it's much easier to mine data let's say on sequels and on um, and and um, on series uh, than it is on original totally new uh, ideas this being said I, I agree with you naima that the more the world of film and series go towards normalization data driven you know this more manufacturing you know more industrialized process with less creative um, bets, the more the audience at some point will feel the need of originality. 
there is there is there is a big swing that is been going on for the past 10 15 years towards um, very data driven uh, products as opposed to um, to to original creative films but you know people still want to read books that have a real voice by the author there is definitely room for films and series that have an original voice uh, and i think you know it might not be half the market or the mainstream mainstream but because usually more original indie films don't require the same level of budget it's okay if it's only 5 to 10% of the market um, the, the the whole industry is right now trying to find where where there is space for the indie voices let's say we are you know already well into the panel i don't know i don't think we'll have the the uh, the time to ask all the questions but maybe uh florian i think you could ask maybe uh, my hand the question number nine and then there is a series of questions which are really to for each of you so maybe uh, that were prepared by the students so if you want to go ahead yep um so the first question is how does one become a festival director i was wondering if you need experience in the film industry as in did you work your way up traditionally by working in movies and then it went into festival work? Or, um, I mean, maybe you can offer us a little insight on your background. And, and I, would, I would add, you know, the question that I was thinking of, which is also how important are the festivals for the uh, <clears throat> movie industry today? Um, well, answering Florence's question, I. I did not work my way up. I, I, I jumped into the deep end <laughs> because I just loved movies and I realized the power of the image. And I had been in this country for several years and um, realized, and it was at a critical moment in the 80s when there was so much um, attention paid um, in the nightly news and the press about what was going taking place in Ethiopia at the time? There was a big far, um, crisis. A farm, uh, uh, you know, there are people starving, and um, simultaneously, the demarcation African American became the official name of people of African descent. So you had this paradox of things happening, and I felt really frustrated because I felt my backstory was never. Um, taken into context. It was just, there are these images and then there's someone else speaking about why I'm going to become African-American, you know? And I wanted to, I, I, it was an intervention, you know? I, I needed to, to find a way to um, correct something or at least have my voice present in that conversation. So um, loving, movies and um, also discovering this, you know, incredible canon of films that were made by African directors, which I discovered here. I mean, coming from Sierra Leone, I never, I saw British films. I, in fact, my first um, exposure to the, to, to the uh, moving image was uh, one I did not like. I was born in, before independence in Sierra Leone and um, on Saturdays, your parents would drop you off at the army, British Army barracks, and you would get to, you know, at their canteen, they showed cartoons to kids, or you took piano lessons or ballet lessons. And those films were always cartoons that depicted gollywogs and, you know, who were the gollywogs. And I definitely, I didn't know how to express what I felt, but I knew I didn't like it. <laughs> I didn't find it funny. And so um, I decided to do ballet classes. So that was my first exposure. But then when I came here, um, I fell in with a really great set of artists who really introduced me to so much. And I got to see, I would spend, I was, I came back from school and this was the time and I started working when you had two hour lunches. I would go to the Paris theater and maybe sometimes it was myself and the projectionist in there. 
I saw Pichot, I saw Ran. I, I mean, I just, and then of course, I got introduced to the works of Sam Ben. And um, so I saw myself in that landscape and I knew that rhythm. And, and then of course, um, I decided when this, this, um, you know, um, news of, 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 of what was taking place on our continent was so um, prevalent at the time in the nightly news and not having that backstory, I kept thinking, what can I do? How can I insert my voice in this conversation? And that was one of the sort of light bulb movement moments for me to think about starting the organization. And, um, and of course, you know, I learned so much along the way and I cringe at thinking of what I said 30 years ago when I first started and what I know now, um, if I had known it then, I probably would not have started it, but I took the leap and um, I'm very happy I did. I'm really proud of the work we do because also there are these artists who are giving us this incredible body of work, telling our stories. And I know what they go through in order to make those movies. I know every, every filmmaker, every creative says, it's not because you're not on, you know, coming from that part of the world. It's, it's the same for us here, but I think it's doubly a challenge for that side of the world. And uh, artists, you know, producing works there. And um, film festivals in general for me are, really the barometer for filmmakers, regardless of their industry status, you know, to measure the reception to their films. And I mean, you have the audience, you have the, you have a, a wide breadth of, 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 you know, the cinephile, the students, the, the industry person there, and you can gauge, no, you know, whether it's Quentin Tarantino or an up and coming indie director, the festival is an important space. And also for the niche market, you know, if you are, if you want to learn more about a subject or you know where to go and you can flip through, any, through the catalog and learn, even if you just saw two films, but you see there's this really amazing, you know, uh, amount of work that is of interest to you. And, um, so uh, for us, you know, the festival also serves as a, I mean, it's not only just showing films, it's also the conversation that then sues, you know, the exchange, the dialogue that takes place in that, that safe space. You're also creating this safe space for people to be able to, to, to exchange ideas. And I, I always say that the screening and the conversation are equally as important. You know, the post-screening discussion, especially based on the subject matter and the themes and the people whose stories are being told. And, and it's just, um, and you can also, you know, through the festival, you know, um, how would you say, give a shelf life to the work. So it's not just showing a film, you know, a film in the festival. We, we do year round programming. So we are bringing, you know, a film and we don't just show a film that was made two years ago because we're also weaving a story when we present the festival. So there's a film that maybe has been made 20 years ago and it's still relevant. It's still as relevant as the film that was just made yesterday and contributes to the story, to the theme. And we always work within a theme when we present our festivals. So. Um... Anybody has anything to add on, the, fest on the, the idea of the festivals? One short thing, because I know we're getting there, but again, with what Mahen is saying, I think there's something too about it being a, a, a chapter in time and, and it being a really important tool to see what's being made now. Because I think there's so many trends too of like what stories are being told year to year. I know me doing this short film when I went to Sundance this year, 
I, I made sure to sign up to see every short film that they had projected there. So then you can see what's being made. If you want to make, uh, if you're going to make a documentary, then you better check out all the all the people. And then you're going to start seeing, oh, the person who produced that is also the person who produced this. Oh, and the writer who did this. You're going to start seeing so many, I think, connections and seeing the webs and a festival is a web. And it's a great way of, you know, you pull, you tap one string and you see where it goes. I think it's a great way to have your finger on the heartbeat of what is current. I'd follow that briefly just to say, I think it's, uh, it, film festivals are absolutely essential at identifying and cultivating talent across myriad roles of directors, producers, cinematographers, writers, composers. We've, at time, we've discovered so many interesting projects that we ran across because we saw it at Sundance or at TIFF or at, you know, and, and you know, there's so many niche and, and, I, and I love what was said about niche film festivals too, because if you're into space, you can go to Houston and there's an entire Houston film festival that focuses just on space. So whatever your area of interest, there's really no endless, uh, there's an endless trove of, of resources out there to satiate your curiosity and develop your interest and help you understand what is being made in that genre. But just to answer your question, yes, it is, you can, it is a career to be a festival director. And the way people get to usually, uh, do, you know, bigger festivals is starting with very small festivals. So if you live in Green Street, you can start the Green, Free, Green Street Festival. And then after two, three years, people in the street like your festival, you graduate to whatever, the Soho Festival. And mm -hmm. you, you know, wherever you are, you can make a festival because people like the principle of festivals. And, um, and it's, a real, it's a real craft and skill to be managing a festival. And, and there's no, nothing is too small in a way. Thank you. Uh, and it, you're, you're sort of like the focal point. You know, you're a programmer and you're a curator. You're bringing all the stakeholders together, and it, there's so many layers. But it's like also, it's there's there is this. It's like building a house almost. You know, and when it's completed and it's standing and it's solid, that is when the you know you. I mean, for me, that's that's when I feel a lot of relief and I can breathe because you have to understand that audiences are more informed than you know, than you think, and you never underestimate the intelligence of the audience. And I think also, especially the type of work we're doing, it's not, it's the, the totality of it, some, how someone enters, how they the seat, the presentation, it's really, and I think this has what also contributes to the loyalty we've, the loyal base we've built because you have to respect the people who come in there and whose stories you are telling. And also the filmmakers, you know, for the filmmakers, you know, this is this market coming to the Americas outside of Africa, you know, this is where you have the most diverse group and they really, really appreciate the exchange they, they, um, that of the people they encounter. And um, so it's been, uh, it's it's been quite a journey. Thank you, Maya. No, Maybe actually, Naima yeah. might take over next. You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> too Maybe heavy. Actually, too heavy. <laughs> I think the next question from Florian. Maybe you can ask uh, the question number five, and it's uh, maybe. Uh, um, Naima can answer that. Yeah, case. definitely. So, um, question five would be: How has the casting process changed since social media and the global pandemic? And also as an actor, did you use the extra time at home to maybe polish your craft? And then if you want, you can maybe follow that up with one last question by uh, in the Q and A. Yeah. Um, whew, that's a lot of questions in one. Um, I think um, just to reiterate what I said before about the pandemic changing, changing things. I mean, I was already doing self tapes before the pandemic started. I think it just solidified that. Um, I think in a lot of ways it's been good for us actors. Cause I think, um, I don't know. I know personally I've done every, you know, I've worked as like a theater 
you know, labor, free theater labor. I've done every job you could do. So I know that there's so many other elements that go into it. But when you're doing your self tapes at home, you have to all of a sudden become your own director, your own cinematographer. Nobody's going to zoom on me in an intense moment. So maybe I've got a big line and I just, and I just lean in. And what does that do? And having to think about what does that mean? What does that look like if I exit this way? Or what does that look like if I exit this way? All these like little things that all of a sudden, I, for me, feel really juicy and exciting that I get to be at home and I can, you know, and I can be like, oh, I'm supposed to drink a cup of water. I'm not going to show up to the casting office with my glass in my purse. That's just weird. But I'm at home. I've got a glass of water. So I feel like the self-tape process, at least in the pandemic, is like, become a little bit more fun for me at least. Um, social media, I think that's a really big question to um, tackle. I think it's kind of become an inevitable part now of this industry. So much promotion relies on social media. I think a lot of celebrities also feel like social media has helped them take back some of their agency, some of their narratives, just thinking back 10 years and being like, oh, it's the paparazzi now who have all the information about you and they're making money off of that. But now you have your Instagram and you can be in a celebrity's home in a way that the paparazzi can't ever be. So I think social media can be a lot of reclaiming for people, but I also think sometimes it, um, I also sometimes think it can be kind of a trap. I think I see this especially in LA of people who are like so obsessed with how many followers they have that then that's all that they work on. And then you show up to set, but you don't know your lines. Like, I don't care how many followers you have, you have to do the job. Um, so I think, I think more and more it is becoming an important part. I just think it's important to know what you want your social media to be doing and then do that. Uh, if you want it to be a work account, then then you use it to do things that feel professional and you're going to promote yourself on it. But if it's going to be just a fun account, then it's that's for you and your friends. You know, I think I think you're allowed to have both of those. Um, yeah, I think some projects are going to ask, oh, do you how many followers do you have? Um, I've gotten that in auditions. I'm like, uh, I have, you know, Um so I think it is about also knowing what kind of projects are going to want that, knowing what projects you want to do and what that's going to require you, require of you on social media and then working towards that. Um, and then there was another part of the question too. Was there a third part? In the chat. Mm. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, Michael asked another question. Mm. Uh, uh, how do you balance casting by specific ethnicity? with the needs of actors to avoid typecasting and expand their range. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm not a casting director, so I'm not sure I can completely answer to that, but I've definitely gotten roles where I don't completely align, you know, with the ethnicity that's on paper, but oftentimes I'll put ethnically ambiguous and I can fit nice and snug in that category. I think, what all I feel like I can do is show up to the role as myself and just bring as much of myself as I can bring. Because at the end of the day, people are going to have life experiences on paper. There's going to be what's in the breakdown, what's in the character description, but that person's a human and that's what you want to do. And, um, and, and if someone really needs a specific ethnicity, then they'll go with that person. But all that I can give, I can't change my genetics for a tape but I'm me and I have to think, how would I, how would I approach that if that were me, no matter what the background is? Um, and I think that's how you avoid typecasting. It's just having people be their most authentic selves. And, and if the script is well-written, hopefully then you're gonna be able to navigate and, and find new things and find new corners of yourself and, and, um, and expand their range, I think. Uh, that's a question I think a lot of actors grapple with is people are afraid of being a typecast but I think um, there's always an opportunity to expand your range in so far as um, tackling a scene maybe there are two similar scenes but maybe you tackle them two different ways um, and that's a good kind of challenge for your range 
uh, that reminds me the other question you know, i'm monologuing all of a sudden the other Is question you're coming no Ooh? No, you want to question coming. about the pandemic? Um, I'm just going to type. I'm going to type the answer to that one about what yes, craft okay. in the pandemic. I'm going to type that in the chat, and I'll let you guys ask the other right. questions. Well, we unfortunately we are coming to the end of this panel, and so I wanted to ask you all, as uh, you know, very shortly uh, as a conclusion, um, what do, would you say to a young person who wants to break into this sphere? as an actor, writer, producer, or festival director, uh, voila, maybe as a conclusion. So if each of you can say, I know it's very short, in a couple of sentences, uh, what would be your recommendation for all these wonderful students who are thinking about uh, getting into this, uh, this industry? Maybe Jonathan, you want to start? Sure, thank you. And uh, thank you again for the invitation. Great to be here. And um, I hope to do this again sometime soon. I would say uh, in closing, I'd, I'd echo my previous sentiments about what makes a great producer. I think you have to be an enterprising, curious, open-minded person who is willing, ready, and able to figure out how to solve all sorts of problems. Uh, the, the, the producer role, uh, as Alexis says, has so many different tracks and, and potential to take on so many different uh, aspects from story to problem solving to uh, connecting people to financing and, and deep pockets to finance beautiful films. Uh, I think never losing that sense of curiosity and being ready to do the research and the homework and being willing to be wrong and admit it and to be humble uh, is, is probably the, the defining characteristics that will define a successful career. So, thank you, Jonathan. Alexi, you want to go ahead and have any recommendations? I, I think, yes, I think the most difficult thing is to be honest with oneself. Yes. Um, it, what I mean by this is that there's great social pressure and family pressure to push people in one direction or another. I mean, rarely it is take, you know, go for being an actor because that's the most precarious and most difficult. Um, but if your heart really is in being a, either an actor or a director, it's not a great idea to become a you know fantastic distributor or, or producer because you're you're actually wasting time uh, because you're never going to be a very happy producer if you really want to be an actor or a director. Uh, you're going to always feel you're a frustrated director. I, I've known some really amazing producers who, when I started in film, I thought they must be the happiest creatures on the planet. They've had five Oscars in their feature film as producers. And then I met them, I realized they were frustrated directors. I think it is more important to actually make films and decide early enough what is the capacity that according to one's own personality, you're going to be most uh, accomplished and satisfied in. And it's very difficult to know yourself when you're 20 years old. Uh, but it's also important. But actually, I think if you're honest, you know yourself. Uh -huh. And uh, the problem is that, you know, peer, peer pressure, family pressure, social pressure often goes in a different direction. So that's what I would say. I'm gonna follow up because mine is kind of similar to yours, Alexis. I think um, I would say figure out, be as specific as possible with what you wanna do. And that of course can change as you go through life, but even saying, I want to act or I want to direct or I want to produce, what kind of films, what scale of films, where, and the more specific you can be, the less energy you're gonna, cause it takes so much energy being in, and just being alive, but also in this line of work is like, you don't need to spend on all this other stuff. If you know, I wanna make films that are about these kinds of stories with people who feel like this and people who work like this, and I wanna work a specific way, then you can take actionable steps towards doing that. I think just saying, I wanna direct is, 
is too broad and might cause some suffering because you feel disappointment at everything you don't get. But if you know exactly what you want, the things that don't come your way that aren't that will be like, oh, well, that's not what I wanted anyway. And um, my other little one, sorry, Pascal, for cursing is don't be an it's asshole. Um, I think there's just don't, yeah, don't be an You're asshole. On. I think life is too short and everybody knows everybody. And we're in this line of work because we've got creative spirits, whether you're the gaffer or whether you're the executive producer, everybody is in there for the love of this magical thing. And everybody has something to give. So greet that with grace and kindness. And yeah, don't be an asshole. Mayan, you want to have the last words? Well, I think being honest, telling an honest story always resonates with whoever. You might not look like me. You might not... The language I don't understand, but once it's honest, I get it. And authenticity and be ready to don't feel bad to make mistakes, you know? And you tell the story you know, or you want to tell, but be honest about it. That's really, you no, know, it's, it's, it, it, I sometimes for us, when we're, when we're previewing work, it might not have the best production value, but when the story is honest, it, you forget everything else, you know, it hooks me in. Yeah. So thank you, thank you so much all yeah. for, for being thank on you. this panel. Very inspiring you. words. And uh, we touched many questions. So uh, it was, uh, we had more questions, but uh, you know, the, the conversation started and I think the students, uh, if you okay with that, I will share uh, your emails with the students who have eventually more questions. And, uh, you know, this is a, this webinar has been recorded. And so, you know, I know that uh, a lot of people will be seeing it. Who couldn't be here tonight will be uh, uh, listening to it uh, on our YouTube channel. So thank you very much. Thank and, you. Uh, Love you, you everyone. Bye, good night. Bye-bye. Thank you.